time scale of one second to few minutes as the universe expands, it started synthesizing elements in the sense that the, the primordial soup which was there starts coming together and the protons coming together, two protons and two neutrons, these are the elementary particles of which atoms are made, will form things like a helium atom, a helium nucleus. This thing happened somewhere when the universe was about one second or so. Then for a very long, long time, nothing much happens. Typically it is between some 300,000 years to 700,000 years, depending on the model. So between a few seconds to a minute to something like 300,000 years, the universe is a pretty boring place. And this is actually to do with the physics which we completely understand. The energy scales involved at this time are like a uh, few million electron volts. People do routine experiments at those energy scales. There is nothing mysterious about that. These are the nuclear energy scales. And the energy scales involved here is like tens of electron volts. And uh, again, it is laboratory physics. Now, the difference between tens of electron volts and a uh, few million electron volts is what translates from one second to 300,000 years. So the universe has to cool down and it has to come to a state where the nuclei of atom can combine with electrons and form neural atoms. Now for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, let me just give a brief introduction. The atoms are made of essentially three constituents. At the, it is like a tiny planetary system. At the center there is protons and neutrons. And hydrogen is one exception which has only a proton. And then around it there are electrons which are going around. Now these electrons are negatively charged and the protons are positively charged. And the charged particles interact with radiation. Now when, uh, when the universe is very hot in this space, you cannot really form these neutral atoms. The, the, as soon as an atom gets formed, a photon will come and knock it off and it will separate it out. But when the universe has cooled sufficiently, the electrons can combine with the atoms to form neutral atoms. Again, this is something which I'm sure all of you would have heard. This is called the fourth state of matter or plasma. If you come from this end upwards, when you take a matter and heat it up, it from a solid it becomes a liquid and then it becomes a gas. And if you heat it sufficiently high, the electrons get separated from the uh, nuclei and it goes into a plasma state. So the universe was in a state of a plasma here. And then it became a neutral object. Now why is it so important? Because as our story proceeds, you will find that this is a very crucial fact. Once this happens, the material becomes neutral. I mean, it is neither positively charged nor negatively charged because the protons and electrons have come together. Once something becomes neutral, the electromagnetic field does not uh, interact with it. And the photons, the quanta of light or the light waves from there does not interact with matter. So the light waves from this time when the universe was 300,000 years till today, something like 12 to 15 billion years, those light beams are coming towards you. Okay. So you can actually measure and observe what happened at the universe at this time. This was a time when the universe was like 1,000 times smaller than the present size. And these observations were first made in 1992. So that is why I said cosmology became a science pretty late and uh, it was very dramatically confirmed in 2002. These are very recent observations. And so we can actually see what the universe was at that time. And this is the moment of what you call the radiation decoupling. And after that all the structures which you see in the universe like galaxies etc. form. Now just to give you an orientation of what the time scales in this are uh, related to, here is a picture. Let us assume that the Big Bang took place yesterday middle of night at 12 o'clock. Now, now we are what? Uh, 6.40? Okay, so today, the, the time today is somewhere after this. The earliest life has just formed. So here is Big Bang at uh, sort of uh, 8 seconds after that the first atoms form. And the stars and galaxies form about 29 uh, minutes after that. The sun was born around uh, 4 p.m., not a.m., 4 p.m., that is just about a few hours back. And uh, Earth was born some 30 minutes after that, and it goes on all the time like this. And uh, we are still not at a stage where dinosaurs have disappeared or died. 
and the humans rise today night, uh, four minutes before the uh, midnight, and the present day is actually 12 midnight tomorrow, and the sun will become a red giant and explode at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. So you find it is a very skewed representation of time. I mean, the time is not moving uniformly. There are phases where nothing much happens in the universe, and there are phases where there is a lot of activity. So this should give you a feel for that. Okay. Now let me get back to this uh, this phenomena I told you that you can actually see the light from a time when the universe was thousand times smaller. The cosmologists are a privileged lot in the sense that these are the only ones who can see into the past. This is because light takes certain amount of time to go from one point to another. When I look at you, I don't see you as you are right now. I see you as you are a fraction of a second earlier because the light takes that much of time to come from there. Okay. When I look at the sun, I see it as it was eight minutes earlier. <laughs> so in the same way, if you can see further and further into the space, you are actually seeing the universe earlier and earlier. So this is one of the earliest phases in the universe which we can directly absorb. What is plotted there is the intensity of radiation as a function of frequency. Don't worry about its details. There is a theoretical curve which is what it should be if our theoretical structure, all that I have described to you is not a fairy tale but is really true. And these are the actual observations. And you may think that it is it is sort of no big deal until you sort of read this or what I have written down here. The yellow bars in this graph are exaggerated by a factor 400. If I put the actual error bars, you won't be able to see it. Okay. So these are these are extremely accurate measurements which were made in 1992, and the theory and the observation agree so well. And this has been one of the strongest evidences in favor of the expansion of the universe or the Big Bang model of the universe. Now given this much, the first question which will come to your mind is will this universe continue to expand forever? Now the answer to that will take us closer to what we want to uh, study. Whether it will expand forever or not depends on a particular quantity which the astronomers denote by the Greek letter omega. This measures the strength of the expansion compared to the gravity. It is like a stone being thrown up from the earth. Now, if you throw the stone with a particular speed and it is moving up, if you throw it with sufficient speed, it can escape the gravity of the earth. And, but if you didn't throw it with sufficient speed, then it will go up to a particular height and will fall down. So in the same sort of way, the universe is expanding with some velocity. And if its speed is sufficiently high, it can expand forever compared to the gravity of the matter which is trying to pull it down. So we need to find a ratio between the strength of the expansion rate and the strength of the gravity. And if this ratio is 1, it will just coast along. If it is greater than 1, it will collapse back. If it is less than 1, then it will expand forever. So we need to know this. Now out of this, this expansion rate is easy to measure. That Doppler effect which I told you will tell you what is precisely the rate at which the universe is expanding. What we need to know is the amount of matter which is needed to stop the expansion. It actually turns out to be very small. If you have five atoms per cubic meter, then the universe will collapse back. Okay, it is like about 50 snowflakes in the volume of the air. Okay, it's a very tiny amount of matter, and the question is whether we have it. So how do you find it? You just go there and count it all. This is what astronomers do. Okay, not quite the way he is doing it here, but uh, that is basically the idea. You go and count all the matter which is out there. When you do that, you get an answer. You find that the total amount of matter which is emitting any kind of signal to you makes just about 4% of the matter which is needed to make the universe collapse again. Okay. So if this is the story, then the 